Okay. <laughs> right. So, can everybody remember where we left off? Docafile. Anyone? Yeah. Docafile and data only containers. Yeah. 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 Sorry, guys. That, that's all right. Um, okay, so so we left off by um, producing data only containers, which held MySQL data, and I I was in MySQL service running the MySQL service and um, there being a kiddie care database populated with all of the tables, all of the data right there in your MySQL service. So restoring from a data only container. And obviously we'd spent quite a bit of time going through doc files, what they are about and how to write them. So what we're going to kind of finish off the workshop with is going through um, how we can automate builds of images, of Docker images, from our Docker files. Because um, at the moment you have a Docker file which you build on your local machine to create an image, and that's kind of it. But we want to be able to automate that process. Um, we're going to go through some extended uses of Docker machine. We're going to run through something called Docker Compose, which you can use to set up um, environments of containers. And um, following that, we will touch on something called Docker Swarm. We won't go into too much detail there, partly because I don't know a lot about it, um, but also because it's not a production-ready service either. So it's still very much kind of in beta development. Um, we'll also uh, go through some security aspects and then we will finish off with um, a possible development workflow. So with automated builds, so these automated builds are there for you to <coughs> be able to automatically have an image built for you from a Docker file. And this is done from a repository, either GitHub or Bitbucket. Um, when you set up an automated build, and we'll do this, um, I know with Bitbucket, I'm not entirely sure with GitHub, whether this happens, I'm sure it does, but when you set up an automated build, it automatically adds a post service hook to the Bitbucket repository, so that as soon as you commit something to that repository, it will then trigger um, a post service hook down to Docker Hub, which will then rebuild the image for you, which is pretty nice, pretty cool. Um, another thing that you guys should know about automated builds is that you can also add webhooks to those automated builds themselves. So on Docker Hub itself, you can add a webhook saying when this image has been rebuilt, do X or do Y. So that's something which we're not utilizing at the moment, but yeah, it's something which, which people should know about. So, the benefits of automated builds. Um, with an automated build, you have your image on Docker Hub and you immediately have trust in that image because you can see exactly how that image was built up. Um, if you just have a random image that is being hosted on Docker Hub, you don't know all of the steps and processes that were used to create that image. You just know it's there and you've got to trust that um, that image is doing exactly what it sells, says and it's got no malicious <coughs> stuff in it. If it's an automated build, you can examine exactly how that image was built. So it's really important there. Um, so the way it does that is from Dockerfile visibility. The Dockerfile is there within Docker Hub, clear for you to see, clear for you to follow the steps and sequences that were used to create the image. And yeah, that's also a good thing because if you ever want to extend the image or kind of find <coughs> out a bit about it, find out maybe what kind of ports are exposed, maybe, um, I don't know, what kind of commands it's running, that kind of stuff, you know, it's important to be able to analyze the Dockerfile. Um, easy maintenance, so from that, um, 
if you ever make changes to your Docker files, you, know, you want to ensure that the image you're providing to the rest of your team is the up-to-date image. And if you don't use automated builds, you have to then go in and manually build the image yourself, push it up to Docker Hub, and make sure that that is maintained at the latest version. With automated builds, that takes care of all of that for you. Um, and kind of finally, it gives you, because we're hosting our Docker file on Bitbucket now, or on GitHub, it gives you version control over it. So if someone now goes in and screws up the Docker file and that results in a broken image, then you can actually trace it back, go back through your commit history, um, revert it maybe, fix the commit, um, and get your image back up and running as soon as possible. <coughs> so, demo time already. We've got a lot of demos on this. Um, and I've, <coughs> again, kind of like the last one, these are all kind of winging it, but we'll carry on with where we left off. And we left off previously, we'd created a very simple Docker file for Beanstalk. I don't know if you guys remember that. So literally, <coughs> um, it's from a base CentOS 6 image, and it uh, installs a bunch of tools required to download the tar file for Beanstalk, um, extract it, and compile it. And then we run it as part of command. So does that, everyone, does that make sense to everyone? Right? Um, we are now going to host this on Bitbucket. So we'll do this kind of completely from scratch. Um, so if we go to Bitbucket, um, and if I go and create a repository, and we'll call it, and I'll, I'll leave it under David Simon Ward rather than polluting our world source repository, but we'll call it um, Dockerfile Beanstalk. And that's all fine. And we're going to add, uh, actually, let me start with this up. OK, so Dockerfile Beanstalk here. And we're going to add an origin to that. Uh, first, I've got to initialize the Oh, crap. Sorry, guys. I've got to agree to the terms and conditions of Xcode in order to run git commands. And hopefully it won't take <laughs> too long. OK, sweet. <clears throat> OK, so we've initialized um, our entry repository. And then we will. Push everything. You. Um, just add everything to the repository. If you do, it can stay there. So it should add it to the testing. Or you need to do a commit. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's up in master, and I don't have any tags. So we've now got in the repository a Docker file. Really simple. Okay, um, and this Docker file, if uh, we build it on our local machine, we'll be able to see kind of. Uh, do, do you guys want me to build it just to see what it, that Docker file does? Yeah. So we'll build it, and we'll call it um, DSW Beanstalk, and. So this is this process here. This build process is what is, is what Docker Hub will do automatically for us. Okay. So this process here is building our image from the Docker Hub from the Docker file. And when we actually tell Docker Hub to create a new automated build, it will do all of this process for us. And whenever we make a change to the Docker image, it will rebuild like this as well. So it's actually it's a very, very simple concept. And whilst that, whilst that goes and um, builds the image locally, what I'll do is I'll go onto Docker Hub and we'll start the creation process for 
building and automated build. Has everyone got Docker Hub accounts yet? Yes, already? Excellent. So you guys should all be getting familiar with this. So what you what you do is instead of creating a normal repository, which, which is just your manual repository, you create an automated build. And if you actually have a look in the world stores um, repositories here, they are all, you can see they are all automated builds. And I think if we're, I would try and enforce, you know, if we're ever building official images for use between teams, they should always be built um, from an automated build. <coughs> So here you can see I've actually linked my account here to Bitbucket. If you go to link accounts, you see I've got <coughs> I've already kind of linked linked uh, linked up Bitbucket to Docker Hub here. You can also link a GitHub account, and that's the uh, those are the only options at the moment. So as soon as you link your account, you can see you've got access to all of the repositories on Bitbucket, and you can see I've got my Docker file Beanstalk repository there, which I've literally just created. And I'm going to set up an automated build under David Sign Ward, and we're going to call it Docker File Beanstalk. Why not? And it's going to be looking at the master branch, and it's going to be public because I don't have any private repositories as part of my own personal account. But whenever you guys set up team repositories again, they should all be private. Okay? And if we run out of private repositories, that's fine. We'll get uh, get some more. Uh, short description. Okay, so we've successfully created it, and you can see we've now got a load of um, additional tabs here. Um, if we go into the um, <coughs> build details, we can see that there have been no builds triggered. If I were to make a change now to the Docker file, it would trigger an automatic build. And let's see if it has actually added that webhook. No hooks. There, okay. So you can see, somehow, Docker Hub, because it's got access to uh, my account, and through that it's got access to create services on Bitbucket, you can see it's created a post um, service hook here. So whenever I create do a commit to this particular repository, i.e. for now if I change docker file, then it will submit a post request to that. Okay. Um, if you want to trigger a build manually, which on first run you have to, then you've got a trigger build uh, link there. So I've just triggered a build, and then you can kind of see, right, we've got um, a build identifier here, and you can see it's pending, and uh, you get logs on uh, the output of how the build went. If the build failed, it'll tell you that it's failed, etc., etc. So, um, just to illustrate this as well, I will go back to our World Stores repositories, and we'll go to uh, MySQL. Have a let's look at that, and you can see we've got the build details here. So you can see every time um, we have changed the doc file or a part of the repository, it goes and builds. And you can see here at this point we actually had a bit of a failure there. And you can click into this build and you can see uh, details of why that build failed. Um, and <laughs> in this case the log is unrecoverable. <laughs> Um, but it's quite useful for debugging purposes in case something's not going the way you're expecting it to go. So if we go back to Dockerfile Beanstalk, you can see build is still in progress. Um, so if we go back to our local machine now, this is where I built the image manually. And you can see now that I've got DSW Beanstalk here. So this is a manual build. And I, I guess the point of this is I'm trying to show you that doing a manual build here and then having the automated build, they are producing exactly the same images. Okay, So if I do a docker run dash d of that image, you can see we've got our service up and running. This is our Beanstalk D service. And if I log on to that, 
and check out the process is running. There, we've got Beanstalk up and running. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to remove all traces of that. So I'm going to stop the image, which would have been Docker stop B7 or Docker stop, um, what's the name? Adoring Almeida. Yeah, if you wanted to do a, a full command for that, I've obviously got, kind of got shortcuts set up. Um, but I'll, I'll do this. Yeah, just to stop all. Um, so that's so now we've removed that image, and we shall remove this. Um, sorry, we removed the containers, and now we'll remove this image as well. Okay, so no traces of that image on my computer at all at the moment. Um, okay, build stasis uploaded. That's still going. Um, what you'll also see is that um, you can browse the actual Docker file using this. Um, if you load a readme into your repository, so this is something I would also encourage us all to do. So for example, if I go to uh, uh, First one. No, no, <coughs> that's mine. Um, well, so it's docker my SQL. And if I go to the source, you can see I've got a readme in there, right? And that is the readme. And if I go to Docker Hub and go to uh, World Stores My SQL, then you can see we've got the readme quite nicely formatted here. Should you know you should uh, give as much information as possible on the actual image, <coughs> and you know to be honest with you, I need to update some of these because some of these are already out of dated. So um, yeah, you got to you got to put some effort into maintaining them as well. Um, the other nice thing about automated builds are that you can um, specify specific branches to build into different tagged images. So I don't know if you guys remember, um, you're able to tag an image with a colon 1.0 or colon latest or colon stable, something like that, put a tag on it. Um, here you could, for example, um, say, right, master will always be, I don't know, you could even say edge, cutting edge, and then you could say branch develop, if you had one, was... Um, <laughs> Yeah. That would be edge. Yeah, this, this, this would be this would be edge. Yeah, and then this would be latest stable. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then you could actually you know tag them that way and kind of organize your automated builds in such a manner like that. Um, so how are we doing with the build? Done. Fantastic. And no errors. So now that we've built that, um, and we called it Dockerfile Beanstalk. Um, I can actually search it because it's a, I should be able to search it because it's a public repository. Let's see how quickly they keep their search index up. Look at that, there it is. So, now that that's there, I don't have to have that uh, repository on my, uh, this. so this particular repository that we've got, you know, the Dockerfile Beanstalk one, which we've got the actual Dockerfile in. Yeah, I can actually get rid of it, just to show that nothing is going to happen from um, the doc file that I've got locally. So now I have, literally locally, I've got no kind of connection to that image at all. I don't even have the doc file. But all I need to do is do a docker pull of David Simon Ward, docker file beanstalk, and it'll go and fetch that from the repository that we've just created from the, the image that we've just created on Docker Hub. Um, and it'll pull the image down on my local machine. And then I should be able to run it in exactly the same way as I ran that locally built image. OK, so we did a Docker run DSW Beanstalk latest. So if I replace this with David Ward slash Docker file forward slash bean. Talk. And there we've got <laughs> stupefied Carson. <laughs> and if I 
log into that. Hopefully, we should be able to see the exact same, yeah, exact same bean sort D process running right here. Yeah. So that's automated builds, and that's how you manage them from a Bitbucket repository or a GitHub repository. So I, I think they're yeah they're great things to know about, and we should for all official images always be using those. Okay, back to the slides. So Docker machine. Can anyone remember what Docker machines used for? Images. No. Anyone else? Apart from Paul. <laughs> Anyone in it Bulgaria Docker, or Hong Kong? The Docker virtual machine. I think it is necessary for uh, Macs or Windows. Yeah. So, well, it's 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 actually its main purpose uh, is to manage Docker hosts and to set up and create Docker hosts for you. You've got the client running on your local machine. You know, the client's great, but the client always needs a host to interact with. And whether you're setting up a virtual box instance um, of a Docker host on your local machine, or using it to set up instances on compatible web services, uh, Docker machine is what's utilized um, to do that. So we've seen it create virtual boxes for us. Uh, which is how we've been using it locally. I don't have you guys. Have you, have you guys used Docker Machine yet to create your first Docker host? Nope. Okay. Well, that's usually the first thing that you'd do. You'd do a Docker Machine. Um, actually, I wonder. Do you want me to do a quick recap on it? Yeah. Um, okay. So, quick, quick recap on the basic. I wonder actually. <coughs> Um, okay. Docker machine. Do you remember we, we had this slide and you, we, we said Docker machine create and then we specified a driver. And we said the driver is going to be called VirtualBox and we're going to call our environment SKUBase. And that fires up a VirtualBox instance with the Docker host automatically installed on it and the Docker client for good measure. But you don't need that. So, if we have a look at um, uh, at my local machine, I can say Docker machine ls, and this tells me that I've got two Docker hosts up and running. I've got dev and I've got kitty care. If I have a look at the images on dev, for example, I've got these images nicely downloaded and installed. If I have a look at kitty care, and you remember you have to use this. Um, Docker machine and dev to set appropriate environment variables which tell your client which Docker host it needs to communicate with. Okay, so here my <coughs> Docker client is communicating with the dev Docker machine. If I switch that to kitty care, I'm going to be switching my all of my Docker commands are going to go to a completely different machine now. And you can see that by if I run the same Docker images command, I've only got one image running on this particular. Um, Docker host. And that's per terminal open. So if you've got two terminals open, you can have different environments. Exactly. So you know, the one thing to remember is if you've got lots of Docker hosts set up, always make sure you're running your commands in the right one. In the right one. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So um, we're going to look. We, we've Just a clear question. Can you get it to um, feedback to the prompt so you know, you know which one you've got running? Um, yeah, yeah, easily with uh, uh, Z shell. Yeah, oh my Z shell. Yeah, just go bash. Yeah, configure it. Yeah, all of this is configurable, isn't it? And it's it's like with Git. Um, you know, if we go into there, you know, we've got feature. I'm this is my Git branch, for example, which I'm on at the moment. Feature KCI checkout. You could have the same thing running to copy that. So just make sure you know. Yeah. yeah. So what we're going to do now is just show how we've been using Docker Machine to manage remote hosts. Because it's all very well using it locally, but at the end of the day, you, know, you set up one host and that's it. And there's, it's not too much fun in that. Um, but there are, as mentioned in that slide, quick note. Oh. Um, Okay, so I'm pretty sure on this slide, 
Um, no, I didn't go in any further into it. But um, Docker Machine has got a bunch of compatible drivers from different web services. And VPS.net, which is what we use for our testing environment, is not one of them. Okay? DigitalOcean, however, is. Amazon Web Services is. Microsoft Azure is. For a full list, um, Docker Machine drivers, supported drivers, and you can see, yeah, we've got Exascale, Google Compute Engine. Um, the generic driver is uh, something you can use if you've got the IP. It, it, can, it could be used for any machine, the generic driver. But <coughs> you lose the added benefit of being able to create instances with the generic driver. One, you, you would have to create a Docker host manually. And then from that point, you could um, import some SSH keys, import the IP address, and then actually add that to your Docker machine as a generic driver so that you could then send Docker commands to any machine, technically. Okay, so that's what generic's for. Um, and then you've got all these, all this other bunch of supported drivers. Um, but we, we have DigitalOcean at the moment, and we may end up um, using Amazon Web Services uh, or something else. Nick is in the process of evaluating all of this. Um, so, again, if you guys want to create yourself an account, I'll add you to the team account here, and you can start experimenting with this, okay? Uh, obviously, we are paying for this as well, so don't just bring up a box and leave it up and running for ages. <laughs> so you can see here, we've got all of these droplets running, and a droplet is essentially like a virtual machine. Um, if you go into API, the first thing you should do once you've created an account is generate... Oh, crap balls. I can't read that, can I? <laughs> you actually can't read them. You can't read them. You do need to save the Okay. <sighs> Bum. Okay, I've got it there, actually. Uh, it's going to take ages to specify. But you, you get a, a token. You get giving yourself an authorization token so that you can then use... Um, the world source team account, and that any requests that you send to DigitalOcean are authorized, and it means you can actually create VMs locally, which is really cool. So if I go back to droplets, um, I am going to go back to the slides very quickly. Okay. Um, so with DigitalOcean, we have um, a variety of options that we can specify with our creation command. This is when we're creating a new droplet. Um, one, the first one, the, there are more than these, but these are the main ones that you'll use, the DigitalOcean region. So it has locations in east and west of America. I think New York City and Salt Lake City. Um, it has region in the EU, which is London, which is great. So that's one we're going to use. By default, it's New York. By default, it's NYC. Um, and I think they, have, hey, they might. Got Netherlands. Do they have Netherlands? Yeah, they do have Netherlands. And then they have Singapore in Asia Pacific, something like that. Um, so you've got that, and then you've got the digital access token. Um, so we're going to go in uh, to my terminal here, and you can see the Docker machines that I've got at the moment are just, they're just local virtual box ones, right? So I want to now decide that, yeah, I've done all my development locally, I want to get a test site up, okay? And I don't have any test sites currently assigned to me, so I'm going to create a new one, okay? Just for my specific uh, task that I'm testing. It's going to be completely encapsulated like this. So I'd say Docker machine, uh, create, driver, and usually we would put virtual box here. Okay, but we're going to use the digital ocean driver, which means it's now not going to create something locally, it's going to create something up in our digital ocean cloud instance. Um, so I'm going to say the digital ocean region is going to equal to lon1. Yeah, I'm totally reading. Um, the digital ocean size, by default, that's 512 megabytes, so half gig. That's 
that should be plenty for most of your needs. I'm just going to leave it as the default there. But sometimes if you're running something huge like central admin, you know, you may want to give it a bit more um, hard disk space, really, because the uh, the database takes up so much so much space that if you just stick with a half gig droplet, it will actually not allow you to import the database because the disk space is too small. Um, and then I'm going to put my dash dash digital ocean access token equals. <sighs> oh, crap. C two seven. It's if we had internet down here, I could send it over. A F D fifty. And then if I type this and it's not correct, it's going to be even worse. <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna call this out, and if I type the wrong letter, let me know. Two nine F six nine seven. Um, D F one five three three A three three uh, six A nine C five A C five um, eight four two B seven five B seven five D A four nine. D B A six C D. I really hope that's right. Okay, and then the final parameter that you put in is the name of your droplet. So um, Paul and I have been using this for a bit, and we've we found that the best way um, is to use the initials of your name and then a three um, three digit long integer. So in this case, it'll be D T S W zero zero one. If you come up with a new droplet it'll be that 02, that 03, okay? And the reason for this is um, kind of when, we look at, when I'm managing how many droplets we have and therefore how much expenditure is going through, I know exactly, you know, if, if I see that these two droplets have been going for two months, I might say, Paul. It's Potter. Oh, it's Potter, PSR. <laughs> <laughs> PSR standard, 001. <laughs> yeah, so... So Paul's got one. Uh, Marianne's got one, um, and these are Paul's as well. And this is actually the Kitty Care International testing droplet. <laughs> so immediately, I can actually go to the person and say, "What are you using that droplet for? Do we still need it? Let's get rid of it." Okay. So if I create that, yes. So it's creating the DigitalOcean droplet. If I refresh that now, there you can see directly locally. It's creating a droplet for me. <laughs> um, and it shouldn't actually take too long. So we'll build a virtual machine, and then I'll show you what we can do with it. Um, and how you can switch between them. So you, know, you can actually see this as being a way to, on your local machine, just communicate remotely with different Docker hosts around the place. So that's really cool. Um, okay, so that's demo time there. All right, we'll move on whilst that's building, and we'll we'll come back just to illustrate kind of a, a few things. But we can move on to Docker Compose. So Docker Compose is kind of for me, it's a bit of a key part of Docker, especially when you're building um, environments which uh, require multiple containers all linked together. Docker Compose can be used to specify your container configuration in one file, and then with one command, you can go and fire up your environment. Um, yeah, with, with literally just one command. Um, so the only kind of problem at the moment with it is it is uh, not production ready yet. So by that, it doesn't mean you can't use it in production, but um, it's at your own risk, and Docker themselves don't advise it just yet. But having um, been to a few uh, kind of workshops and seminars where Docker has been mentioned, I got the gist that a lot of people are using this, and they're using things like Docker Swarm as well in production already. Um, companies like Netflix 
for example. They're actually running most of their ecosystem using Docker, I think, and, and using all of this stuff. Um, so the main commands uh, that you will use, um, Docker Compose Up, which is the same as um, it's the same as Docker. Well, it executes all of the commands in your Docker Compose file. And Docker Compose Stop kind of brings all of those commands down. Docker Remove does the exact same thing. So let's say you've specified three images in your Docker Compose file. Docker Compose Up will run all of those. Docker Compose Stop will stop all of those, and Docker Compose RM um, it will warn you before you. Uh, It'll say, are you sure you really want to remove your containers? And you just hit yes, and that's fine. Or you can specify the dash F flag, I think it is. Um, yeah, the other thing to note is, just like with Docker Run, we have the run in detached mode. Yeah, you need to specify that same flag if you want all of your containers to run in detached mode. Um, and you can use the dash F flag here um, with up to indicate where a YAML file might be. If you don't indicate with that, it will search for Docker com a file called docker-compose.yml, which must exist in the directory that you are currently in, your current working directory. So this is an example YAML file. Oh, I should actually just uh, do this. So if I were to run docker-compose-up-d on this file, first thing it would do is it would fire up a Redis uh, container called KiddieCare Redis um, and it actually prefixes most of uh, all of these containers with a namespace as well. So I think um, this would actually technically fire up a container called KiddieCare underscore KiddieCare Redis um, and it would use the world source Redis image to run that container. Same with KiddieCare MySQL. Um, Beanstalk, yeah, nothing special there. Okay, so the Kitty Care Web One, we're doing a bit more here. We're still running it from the World Stores SKU base image, um, but we're also going to mount our site SKU base directory into var www SKU base within the container. We're going to create some links from previous containers that we fired up and map those to host mappings here. Um, and we're also going to set some environment variables. So you can see. Um, something like this can easily be mapped out to a single command. So for the for the Kitty Care Web configuration here, this is the exact same thing as running um, Docker Run dash d dash dash name Kitty Care Web um, dash v uses David Ward sites SKU base colon var www SKU base. Uh, dash dash links, kitty care redis, redis, dash dash links, kitty care mysql, mysql, dash dash links, kitty care beanstalk d, beanstalk d, dash e, virtual host, dev kitty care, dash e, environment, uh, enable https equals true, um, and dash e, enable xdebug equals true. And then finally, world source skew base, enter. <laughs> so it's, it's the exact same thing. You can, it's really easy to kind of map it out from a manual single container firing up instance into your Compose YAML file. Who does the links? What's it doing again? So the links, um, it creates host mappings to the IP addresses, the internal IP addresses of the containers that you're linking to. So in, for example, in this instance, KiddieCare Redis container will be fired up. It will have an IP address of, I don't know, 172.10.52.2, OK? And then when we say to Kitty Care Web, right, we're going to create a link between Kitty Care Redis and Redis. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to find out uh, the IP address of this container. It's going to create a host entry file in Etsy hosts of this container, mm -hmm. saying for that IP address, 172 blah blah yeah. blah, um, link that to Redis. Yep. And then also link it, it, it actually puts in uh, the IP address as well and it puts in um, Kitty Care Redis, all in the host file. So it actually creates three entries for that. OK? So it means that, uh, yeah, uh, that's, it, that's it, the container ID, not the, not the IP address. Yeah. So it means, yeah, you can access, um, from this container, you can access this container either by specifying any of those three things. 
Um, and it means in your then in your configuration file, when you say uh, my Redis host is going to be X or my, my MySQL host is X, mm -hmm. you can then just specify MySQL. Yeah, or you can specify the container ID. So what we are going to do now is create a Docker Compose file. Um, demo time. Okay. So, um, I am going to, what's this? Okay, I'm just going to create Docker Compose test. I'm going to see into that. And I'm going to create a docker compose.eyml and I'm going to edit it. Okay, so then the first thing I'm going to do, we're just going to use uh, that beanstalk D image that I created. Yeah? Um, so I'm going to say my beanstalk D is going to consist of um, David Simon Ward. Anyone remember? It was just Beanstalk. Was it just Dean Beanstalk? It did have a D at but I think it was Docker. Let's just. Um... Oh. Wasn't it Docker file? Sorry? What, what? Ah, oh, yeah, 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 I think you're right. Uh, we've actually got it there. And I'm actually, I'm going to delete this just to show you, to prove the point. Ah. Ah. Okay, so now in this particular Docker host, I've got note. Okay, so if I simply do a Docker <coughs> compose up, then this is going to look in this directory. And within this directory, we've got docker compose. And if we have a look at what it is, it's just my, my beanstalk D. And it's just image. And then it provides the image name. So if I do a docker compose up without the dash D flag, then you can see we don't have the image on our local host because I just deleted it. It's going to go and get it. And it's going to fire up um, that container running in the foreground. And this is the last time I delete the image, just to prove it to you guys. <laughs> Question was this waiting. In the links part of the compose, yeah, is it possible to set up other links other than the ones which are for other images in the well? How, how do you mean? You can set up links to anything you want. Right, yeah, so any other image. Baseball. Any um, yeah. other image that you've defined. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So if I wanted to create an environment which was where it pointed every other or as well as a series of, of host names off to a particular image. So you know www.mattressworld.co.uk. Yeah, I actually wanted to instead of go to there, I wanted to go to this other image I've got. If it tries to get to bedroom, I want to go to this image. If it goes to well source, I want to go to this image. You know, so I can actually um, if you, so you basically within the system to stop it escaping from there. Um, do you, you want to manipulate the hosts file? I'm doing this spoofing it, yeah. Basically. So if if you were to to you you wouldn't use the links to do that. Right. You would build your image with that's, particular that's spoofing it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That's that's what I would do. My goodness is being slow. <laughs> Blamen. Okay, whilst that's whilst that's building. <laughs> 
Yeah, where is it? Okay. So, hopefully, and I'm not entirely sure, but I guess it's probably built. There, you can see that we've got my kitty care virtual box instance up and running. So we're kind of flitting back to the you know the Docker machine um, demo here. D yeah, but the Docker machine demo, the advanced usage of Docker machine. No, I'm talking about the that's what yes, yep, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's highlighted in the one. Good point. So there we've actually got um, our droplet, which has been installed on DigitalOcean. And if I have a look, yeah, th these are my local containers running. Um, and if I have a look at my local images, those are my local images. And just in exactly the same way, you do your, um, you set your Docker client to point to the correct Docker host. And now if I do that, if I do a Docker images, what am I going to get? Nothing. Because it's it's got a Docker host on it, but we've not run any commands on it before. It's a brand new droplet, isn't it? Absolutely brand new. And no images. The really nice thing is you can use the shortcuts that you've set up in your own terminal environment um, to create the Docker commands and send them through. Whereas if I were to actually log on to this machine and try and run those shortcuts, obviously my shortcuts wouldn't exist. OK? So once you've got your machine up and running, you can then do everything. Oh, the other nice thing as well about this is with our private repositories, obviously you have to do a Docker login before, right? Um, and if I were to log in to this machine, which you've got SSH keys set up, so the only way into this machine at the moment is via your SSH keys. It doesn't even have a root password allowance on it. There are no path, there's no other method into this box. Um, but you do a Docker machine, SSH, and then DSW001. And you can see now, automatically, I'm logged into that box on DigitalOcean. Right? So if I try and do a DP, it doesn't know what DP is. But if I do a Docker PS, and it knows what that is. Right? If I try and do a Docker pull of world stores now, well, so it's skew base, for example. Not found, okay? Because I haven't logged in on this box, it doesn't know about my Docker, Docker credentials, so it can't see any of the private repositories. If I log out, and I do a Docker pull world stores, and you, know, you should always check that you're running it on the right Docker machine. Yeah, we're on DSW01. So if I do a Docker pull of world stores skew base, then it will be able to do it because it's got all my login credentials here on, on my local machine, which it uses to go and um, log into Docker Hub and access any private repositories. So, okay, whilst that one downloads, which is doing a lot faster. Okay, so this one, so this is Docker Compose. You can see it's finished now. It's downloaded the image and it's attached itself to DC test my beanstalk D1. Okay, so that's the container name and it's running in the foreground now because we didn't specify D. So as soon as I do control C, it'll stop the container. So, whilst that stops, ooh, that's interesting. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up in my Docker file a kitty care beanstalk image as well. A uh, kitty care beanstalk, just a beanstalk console. Beanstalk D console, and I'm going to say image. Do you, do you guys remember this one from the basics? The beanstalk D console. It allowed us to, um, yeah, <coughs> excellent. And then I'm going to say links, and I'm going to link my beanstalk d to a host entry called uh, dsw bean. Um, and then I think I also need to expose some ports. And you know to do that you just specify 8080 to port 80. Okay, with ports. I'm gonna save that and then 
here we can see our docker compose file has been updated and I'm going to run a docker compose up dash d oh. ah yes I think it should be like this Okay, so that was pretty quick, wasn't it? And you can see it's just created those two containers in a split second um, because I'd already downloaded the, both the images onto the computer. And hopefully we can see if we go to the... Um, so to get the IP address of the machine that you're currently on, um, you would do a Docker machine Docker machine, I, well actually you can see the IP addresses there, can't you? Docker machine IP and then the name of the machine. So here I can go to this port 8080 and there we've got the Beanstalk console up and running and if I do an add server and specify the host which we put in our Beanstalk file as DSW Bean, hopefully we should see we've got a Beanstalk service actually running. So you can see, you know, you, we, we've now orchestrated two containers linked together, up and running from Docker Compose. And to bring it down, you simply say Docker Compose stop, down, and then it's stopping the second one. And then you can see now that uh, they've both exited. And then if you want to remove them, docker compose rm. Are you sure you want to? Yes. And that's it. They're both gone. Which is pretty cool. So that's uh, that's docker compose. And you can see you can use it to actually fire up really complicated environments. So here, for example, um, I've got a compose file which... Uh, sets up Redis and it uses the data volumes for Redis from another data only container. Sets up Kitty Care MySQL. It, I just added that as a, to, just to show you guys, which exposes 3306, which it does by default anyway. Maps a bunch of ports, uses the Kitty Care MySQL data, fires up a Beanstalk service, fires up the Beanstalk console in the exact same way, um, and then it fires up the Kitty Care web container to do. Um, to kind of link it all together and provide the actual web service. So you can see it's 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 really kind of powerful. You don't have the Kitty Care Redis data container in here. No, you don't. So that is one thing which Docker Compose cannot handle at the moment is creating the data only containers on the fly. Mm -hmm. I was playing around with having separate Docker Compose files to do that, but the reason is because if you had something like this. Kitty care Redis data. Hey? No, it. You can change the entry point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's the that's not the problem. So you, you can say entry point, and you could say here echo um, bin echo, and then you could say um, I don't know. Um, you, you, you can specify this command as well, the CMD, and do it to, you know, you can actually fire up the Redis data in container, you can create another image to untar your data only yeah. tar into it. But because that takes such a long time, um, these containers then fire up first before the unzip has happened. So it then is not able to, when it when it says volume is from Kitty Care Redis data, at that point the Redis data doesn't exist and therefore cannot find it. So there may be around this, this is kind of one part of the process which I've not figured out how to fully streamline yet, you know, using the data only containers in a one step call. Um, but at the moment it's like two steps. So you fire up your data only containers and then do a Docker Compose up, then you've got your environment. But obviously the ideal thing is for it to just be one step. Haven't got the reverse proxy. Is that, no. is, is that so there's a reverse proxy at the bottom. There's no problem with running it, but you only do it once per host. You only have your reverse proxy running once per host, which is why if you add it in here, 
um, someone may decide to run it twice, and then because you're binding to the same port you've really bound to, you will bomb out. So there's no conditionality in that description? In which? Is that description can't say um, only if not already existing? No, no, no. no, 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 no. Okay, so going back to finish off with the uh, Docker Machine DigitalOcean stuff, you can see we've got uh, locally, I ran the docker pull world source skew base command. And now, if I were to log on to the server, and you remember how we couldn't run this docker pull before, yeah, because no access. If I do a docker images, we've got world source skew base there on the remote server. Okay. So. We'll briefly talk about uh, Docker Swarm, Docker Security, and then um, the final slide will be what I kind of envisage to be a development um, workflow, which we could use with Docker. Um, okay. So, Docker Swarm. Um, this is something which is, again, in beta, it's not recommended for production but um, is there to provide native clustering for Docker nodes. So whilst you can use Docker machine to fire up Docker hosts, um, what Docker Swarm actually allows us to do is manage multiple um, nodes of Docker hosts and balance between them containers. So you could, for example, say, right, I want to have I don't know, 15 web containers running, uh, five MySQL containers, 20 Redis containers, something like that. And what Docker Swarm is supposed to do um, via the Swarm Manager, which knows about all the nodes and it knows information about um, each of the servers that those nodes are running on, it can assign containers to um, nodes based on whether they've got, a, you know, uh, available resource, whether they've got um, disk space, memory free, stuff like that, um, and it can spread out the node clustering between. Um, so it's hyperfight, basically, sort of. <coughs> from the node, all the uh, nodes. Uh, <coughs> same as you'd have a virtual machine hyperfight. No, it does more than that. <coughs> Docker Swarm, I would say. Really? Yeah. So, um, I, I don't know too much about it, but um, yeah, it's key components that you've got are the Swarm Manager, um, the Swarm Nodes, which you've got Docker daemons running on and are able to fire up containers. Um, discovery, so Discovery is used by, used by the Docker, uh, the Swarm Manager in order to find out what uh, containers are running on what nodes and where it can put, you know, fire up new containers. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what the scheduler does, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but Docker Swarm, something we may use in the future, something that's kind of up and coming. It's, it's good for everyone to have it in the back of their minds to investigate later. Um, and then Docker Security. So um, there are some things to be aware of. Um, there is actually pretty good security built into Docker um, just because it uses Linux containers. And some of the key things which were already mentioned in the basics um, workshop were that it uses uh, kernel namespaces and kernel control groups. Um, the namespaces themselves, they completely segregate all of the processes running in a Docker container and shield all of those processes from any other Docker container. So unless you specifically allow certain ports to be open, um, then essentially that container that you're running is completely shielded and all the, all shielded and all of the processes running inside it um, are com are completely in, uh, invulnerable to any kind of attacks from outside. The kernel control groups, it's a mechanism um, which Linux containers use to share resources which are available on the server. 
and um, the great thing about this, and both of these technologies have, they're well established and they've been around for a long time. Um, and yeah, the, Docker uses control groups to ensure that each container gets you know, its fair allocation, its fair resource um, of memory, and CPU, uh, etc. Um, but also the, the nice thing is, uh, is that it ensures that any one single container can't bring down the entire system by kind of by throttling its usage, by controlling its usage of those resources. So it gives some initial protection against things like I know, denial of service attacks. Um, the Docker daemon attack surface, this is uh, to do with the fact that at the moment the Docker daemon um, has to have root privileges to run. So if you're using the Docker API to spawn up Docker containers, then you have to ensure that that API is um, somewhat protected. If there is a vulnerability there and if someone can um, kind of break access to that API, there's a possibility that they can then run commands with root privileges. So that's something which Docker are aware of and it's something um, that they're looking to uh, they're, they're looking in future to enable the Docker daemon to run on its own user and not on root. So that's something that they'll be fixing soon. Um, yeah, Linux kernel capabilities. I, I've got I've got some articles on these if people want to read into them. I there there are other kernel security features as well. Um, so the the other kernel security features you can kind of you can implement. Um, other well-known security systems into Docker if you want to harden it, um, and I can I can send anyone who's interested kind of additional information on these. I've actually got the notes right here. Actually, yeah, I'll send you guys the slides, and they're inbuilt into the slides. So, finally, this is kind of to finish off with what I envisage uh, a possible development workflow to be like for us, and. Yeah, this will involve some tweaking, especially because I haven't um, fully realized this yet. But this is what I could imagine um, us doing. So we'd have our, our code hosted uh, in Bitbucket or GitHub. And we would clone that code onto our development environment. Um, and we would use the images from Docker Hub, our official world source images, to create the services that we need, and obviously this is kind of this is um, applicable to web dev at the moment, but you know, there's no reason why we can't use this for any any other teams. Um, so once we've done a Git clone, we make sure that we've uh, installed Composer, the vendor directory, Bower components, got all of those bits and bobs up and running. And then we mount our code into the world source skew base image, as we do at the moment. And that will allow us to develop on the code locally using whatever IDE you've got. No problems there. Um, you do your development work. And at the end of that, you push your code back to Bitbucket, as we do at the moment, um, with a pull request. So that will then create a post commit hook, which will indicate to Docker Hub, right, I've got some new code here, which is going to be in a separate branch, OK? And that would then, oh, where's my, oh, I think I've left out some stuff. Oh, no. Um, so that would then trigger an automated build. Um, and that automated build would be tagged with, I don't know, something like colon, you know, if you're working on display options, it might be colon display options. And that would produce an image, well source, skew base, colon, display options. You know, the specific feature or bug fix that you are actually um, working on. From there, you then want to get that onto your test environment as soon as possible with minimum fuss. So you use Docker Machine to create a new droplet, as we've seen, using Docker Machine Create. On that new DigitalOcean droplet, uh, you then pull down your normal images. And what I've kind of missed out here, which I think I, I had on a, on a separate keynote, but um, this will 
you will pull down onto here your WorldSource SKU based colon display options. And the automated build as part of the Docker file will actually do a git clone for you as part of this automated build. So this image here will contain all the code that you actually mounted over it here. Okay? So the whole point is this WorldSource SKU based image has got everything it needs to actually run our website, our SKU based code. Um, so because of that, all we'd need to do at this point is fire up these three services um, and testers, wherever they are, they would start testing on that. What about the database? So the database and the data only container is, is something you'd need to set up yourself. That, that's the, the missing link for me in this, in this workflow at the moment. Um, but there may be a way... Um, I don't know, of, of possibly automating that somehow. Maybe using data fixtures for test environments, something like that. So that's kind of how I could envisage, envisage us working. And you know, purely from a developer point of view, you, you do your Git clone, you do your Git flow branching as normal, you've got your images which you're running your services in, you're done with it, you, push it up to Bitbucket, use Docker Compose here, well, use Docker Machine to create a new droplet, Docker Compose to up your, um, your branch and your code, and that's it. You've got a working test site which is identical to that that you've developed on. And that's kind of the key here. Make as few steps as possible um, and testing exactly what you've developed. So those are kind of the core concepts for this. So does anyone have any questions? Nuke? Yeah. I mean, when, the, when we get the new infrastructure, I'll pass about the databases as well. Yeah. So which could be, which are going to be running nightly, I think. Yeah, so we could automatically so have. We can, yeah, we can pull those down. Yeah. And then we can so as, start thinking about as Paul says, this is something we've really been thinking about. Mm -hmm. And with, um, with the new world source infrastructure, um, it will replicate itself into a Pacona slave, which is actually running inside a Docker data-only container. Right. So yes. we can actually just zip that up. So start to think up. about sort of the data handling, but start thinking about anonymizing your data. Yep, we've already thought about that as well. Divya and I went through that a couple of days ago, and there will be a way, once <coughs> it's in this uh, Docker, own, before you create the um, tar of the data-only yeah. container, yeah. that's when we'll run our sanitization as part of creating the tar. And we've already identified about a million tables which can be dropped yeah, as well as the data sanitization part. Yeah. Yeah. So, hopefully you guys are all equipped to go and start using and playing around with Docker. Thank you. Yeah. Bien. No problem. Thanks, Thanks. See guys. See you guys. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks.